In this lesson, we're going to learn about the method of integration by substitution. So suppose we want to integrate a function like x times the cosine of x squared dx. We know that the integral of cosine x dx is sine x plus c. We have a rule telling us that, but we don't have any, any techniques that would allow us to integrate x times cosine x squared. We do know that the function must have an antiderivative because it would be a continuous function. It's the product of two separately continuous functions, so there must be some function f of x such that the derivative of f of x is equal to x squared, or x times the cosine of x squared. So let's just try guessing at it. Uh, one potential candidate Given that we know that the integral of cosine is sine, maybe we try sine of x squared. Okay, and let's see what happens. So if we take the derivative of sine of x squared, so we know how to do that, we've got the chain rule, so d dx of sine of x squared what we would do then is, using the chain rule, we would take the derivative of the outside function, which would be sine. The derivative of sine is cosine. So it would be cosine of the original argument, x squared, but then multiplied by the derivative of the inside part, which would be 2x. And that's actually really close, but it's off by a factor of 2. Um, if we could get rid of that factor of 2, then I think we would have it. So how about uh, 1 half sine of x squared? All right, well, if I take the derivative of this, it would be 1 half times derivative of sine is cosine. We evaluate it at the original uh, argument, which is x squared, but then multiply by the derivative of that argument. So now the 2 and the 1 half will cancel each other out, leaving us with x cosine of x squared. That's great. That's our antiderivative, 1 half sine x squared. So we can say the integral of x cosine of x squared dx is 1 half sine of x squared plus c. So that's excellent. We found the result. But we probably want a more consistent approach here rather than just randomly guessing at what the antiderivative might be. Let's see if we can come up with something. Notice there was an inner and outer function, and that should remind you of things about the chain rule. And in fact, substitution is the inverse of the chain rule from differentiation. So when I have something like the integral of x cosine x squared dx, I need to be thinking in terms of inner functions and outer functions. So for instance, I could say I have an inner function of u equals x squared. And interestingly, interestingly enough, that has a derivative. So the derivative of the function u would be 2x dx. That's written in differential form. Uh, you could write it du dx equals 2x, but I've chosen differential form here for a particular reason, and I'll explain in a moment. And what we can actually say about that is, remember we were off by a factor of 2? So in the original problem, we have this multiplier of x, and we will need to substitute something for dx but there's no factor of 2 inside here. So what I can do is then 
take this and divide that 2 over, and that will give me something that I can directly substitute in for x times dx, those remaining portions. The outer function then would be cosine of u. So this right here could now be written as the integral of, so the cosine of x squared gets replaced with the cosine of u. And then x times dx together get replaced with 1 half du. So times 1 half du. And effectively, what I've done is I've substituted my variable uh, x into a new variable u and ended up with an integral that I can actually evaluate at this point. Just pull the 1 half out. That would leave me cosine u du. I know already how to integrate cosine u. That is just the sine of u. And lastly, I need to make sure I go back to the original variable uh, because I started with the variable x. I need to end with the variable x. But since u is equal to x squared, that's very easy to do. And without any random guessing, I've come up with the antiderivative of this particular function. And that's the basis of the substitution method. Now suppose we want to integrate a function of the form the integral of f prime of g of x times g prime of x dx. Again, think of your chain rule here. If we let u be g of x, so we make that substitution, u is that inner function, then the derivative of u is g prime of x dx, and we end up with the integral of f prime of u du is the antiderivative f evaluated at u plus c, which is the antiderivative function evaluated at g of x plus c. And that's the general uh, explanation of how substitution works. So let's work through some examples and see how it's actually performed. All right, I have the integral of x cubed plus 1 times the quantity 3x squared dx. What I have to do is, in this case, I could distribute 3x squared into that set of parentheses, use the power rule. That would be fine here, but I'd like to use substitution um, otherwise. So I have to choose something to be uh, u, my substituting variable. And what I'm going to choose here is the x cubed plus 1. Because in general, what you're trying to do is pick some part of the function that looks like if you did the derivative of it, would match very closely some other part of the function. So if I do the derivative of this choice of the variable u, I would have 3x squared dx. So then what will happen is the x cubed plus 1 will get replaced with u. The 3x squared dx will get replaced with du. And I would still have an integral that I could evaluate, u times du. I can use the power rule here. It would look like u to the second power over 2 plus c. Or going back to the original variable, x cubed plus 1 squared over 2 plus c. And I've got the integral this way without having to distribute and using the power rule. Okay. Let's look at another example. The square root of 2x minus 1. I want to integrate that with respect to x. 
So in this case, there's not really any algebra that I could do to get this in a way that I could use the power rule. So substitution is necessary in a lot of cases. Again, what you have to do is pick some part of the function whose derivative looks like another part. So in this case, I would choose u to be the part underneath that square root because that square root is the thing that I need to really simplify. That's also an indicator. The derivative of this would be 2 times dx because when you change the variable in the integrand function, you also have to change the variable with which you're differenti or integrating with respect to. So I need something to substitute for du. So now what's going to happen is this part, the square root of 2x minus 1, will become the square root of u. And then dx, the thing about dx is I have a something to sub substitute 2dx for. But if you're off by a multiplied constant, that's easy enough to handle. You can just divide that multiplied constant over so that your dx matches uh, precisely what's inside your integral. So this will change into, it'll be u to the 1 half power, but I'm going to go ahead and actually, I'm going to factor out that multiplier of 1 half and make this u to the 1 half power instead of the square root of u times du. Okay, now this is something I can use the power rule on. So 1 half times u to the 3 halves power over 3 halves plus c. And then that's 1 half times 2 thirds. Uh, instead of u to the 3 halves power, I'm going to go ahead and substitute back in 4x and make this 2x minus 1 to the 3 halves power plus c. These 2's in the numerator and denominator will cancel each other out. So I have 1 third times 2x minus 1 to the 3 halves power plus c. And if you're ever uncertain whether or not your final answer works, you can always check these. All you have to use is the chain rule from derivatives and take the derivative of the function you just came up with and it should match what you started. And if it does, you know for a fact that you have the correct answer. So you can always go back and check these. Integral of 3x e to the x squared. When you have functions that are exponential, they have always are going to have a, an exponent. And if that exponent is anything more complex than just an x, you're going to use that for substitution. So for instance, if I let u be x squared in this case, then my du would be 2x dx, which is very similar to what I have inside the problem, but not exactly. One thing I can do, however, is I can take that multiplier that of 3 that's inside, bring that out of the integral. Now if I divide both sides of this differential equation by 1 half, then I have something to match exactly for x dx. So I'll still have this 3 out front, but then because of the 1 half du, I'll also have another multiplier of 1 half on the outside. e to the x squared is going to become e to the u. And then x dx is getting replaced with 1 half du. I already placed that 1 half on the outside of the integral, so I just need a du on the inside. So this is 3 halves. The integral of e to the u du is just e to the u plus c. Or 3 halves e to the x squared plus c. 
And there's our answer. Now the trick most of the time involved in substitution is choosing the value of u, making sure you pick the correct value. It's not always clear what to use for u, but I'll give you some general guidelines that will handle most cases. So number one, if you're dealing with polynomial pieces, so inside your problem there's two separate polynomial pieces, choose the part of the equation that's one degree higher than the other. And the reason is, if you do that, so let me give you an example. The part here that you should allow u to be is x cubed minus 1. Because that's 1 degree higher than the part that's on the outside of that square root. So when I do my derivative, du, the derivative brings that power down by 1. So that's why you want to pick the part whose uh, derivative, wh the, sorry, you want to pick the part of the problem that has one degree higher than the other when you just have polynomials. Because the problem is if you chose u, and I'm using red because this is incorrect, if you chose u to be the x squared, then when you get du, you end up with 2x dx. That's not going to be able to help you in substituting for that x cubed term. So always th pick the one that has the higher degree. And if it's a higher degree by 1, that almost always indicates that you're going to be fine. Next up, if you're working with trigonometric functions, just like we did in the first example, which was x cosine of x squared dx, you'll want to pick the part that is the argument of the function. So you have u equals x squared because it's the cosine of the function x squared. The reason you need that to be the case is eventually you're going to have to integrate cosine of something. And all we know how to do is cosine of x or cosine of u if that uh, part inside the cosine is any more complex, we don't have any rules to integrate it any longer. So you would always pick the part that is the argument of the trig function. And the same goes for logarithms as well. Uh, lastly, if you are working with exponentials, so for instance if you have 5e to the 5x dx, then what you want to choose for u is the exponent. Because in the end, we know how to integrate e to the x or e to the u. Anything more complex than that as your exponent, we don't have any rules for. So let u be the exponent, and that should work out if it's going to work out. And keep in mind, these are just guidelines and not rules. So it might not work in every single case. But as I said, it should help you out in most cases. The overarching principle is to pick the part of the integrand that has another part as a derivative. That's really what you're looking for. Now, the technique that I've shown you for substitution is not the only technique of substitution that will work. There's actually a lot of different ways of looking at substitution. One way of looking at substitution is called back substitution. And it's a way of kind of getting creative with how you do your substitution in order to make things to work out. So for instance, if I have the integral of x times the square root of x plus 1 dx, here's the tricky thing about this. Now, if I'm choosing something for u, the most obvious thing would be to pick the part that's underneath the square root because I need my square root to be simplified. Okay, so if I pick x plus 1, then differentiate, I have du equals dx. 
if I go to make my substitutions, then I have something to substitute in for the square root of x plus 1. That's going to be the square root of u. I have something to substitute dx for. That's going to be du. But I don't have anything at all to substitute that variable x for, which is a problem because if you don't have anything to substitute all the variables for, substitution method isn't going to work for you. But sometimes, like I said, you can get creative in how you do things here. So for instance, if you look at this transformation rule, okay, this transformation from one variable to the next is invertible which means it has a, it's a linear equation, and so it has an inverse. So if I find the inverse, that's actually one way of going about uh, taking care of my substitution. Uh, the inverse is effectively take the equation and solve it for the other variable. So I'm going to solve this for x and say x is equal to u minus 1. And honestly, behind the scenes, this is kind of what you're doing anyway. Because watch what happens now. Let me take x times the square root of x plus 1 dx and substitute using this rule instead. Now, first thing that is obvious, since I have something solved for x, I can actually replace x with u minus 1. So that outside portion of the square root is taken care of. The inside portion, I have x plus 1, so x gets replaced with u minus 1, then I have this plus 1, dx gets replaced with du. So what happens now is I have u minus 1, and the positive 1 and the negative 1 underneath the square root cancel still leaving me with the square root of u underneath the radical. Well, sorry, u underneath the radical or the square root of u. I can, don't have both there. So that's actually what's more like what's happening when you do your substitution. It's just a little bit easier to think of x plus 1 as a quantity gets replaced all at once with u. And most of the time that works just fine. But occasionally, if you have leftover variables, you can do something like this to help out. And we call that back substitution. Now, since everything is in terms of u, let's see what happens. So the square root of u is the same thing as u to the 1 half power. And u to the 1 half power is going to be distributed into these parentheses so that I can use the power rule. So u times u to the 1 half power is u to the 3 halves power. 1 times u to the 1 half power is u to the 1 half. And of course, there was a minus there, so it's still a minus. This is something I can use the power rule on. It will become u to the 5 halves over 5 halves minus u to the 3 halves over 3 halves plus c. And then, um, taking care of the uh, divided by 5 halves, which would be a compound fraction. I'll make it 2 fifths times uh, the variable u was equal to x plus 1. So I'm going to substitute back in x plus 1 for u, raise that to the 5 halves power, minus 2 thirds times x plus 1 to the 3 halves power, plus c. And this, even though it looks a, probably a bit more complex than what you would have originally thought the antiderivative would have been, you can show that this is the correct antiderivative uh, by taking the derivative of it, and it'll end up with what we started with. Now let's take a look at an example of a definite integral using u substitution. 
it's instructive to point out at this time that the dx in an integral defines the axis for which the endpoints of integration are defined. So when we have a definite integral, that dx tells me which axis I'm integrating with respect to. So the integral from a to b of f of x dx really means the integral from the vertical line x equals a to the vertical line x equals b of f of x dx. So the variable of integration matches the variable in the endpoint of integration. That's really important to understand, okay? If you change your variable of integration to du, then your endpoints no longer make sense with respect to x. If you change the variable of integration, you also have to change the endpoints of integration. Fortunately, it's really easy to change, and it actually saves you some time in the, in the end run. So for example, let's say I have the integral from 0 to 1 of x times the quantity x squared plus 1 squared. If I multiply this out, I could do this without using substitution at all. But I don't want to do that. I want to use u substitution and say u is equal to x squared plus 1, and therefore du would be 2x dx. Inside my integral, I have an x times dx, so I need to adjust for that factor of 2. So I'll just divide both sides by 2, and that will tell me that 1 half du is x dx. Okay, so I'm going to substitute with my integrand. Um, first off, I'll have a factor of 1 half on the outside of my integral. x squared plus 1 is getting replaced with u, so that's now going to be u squared. And then I have x times dx, which gets replaced with 1 half, which I've already placed on the outside of the integral times du. Now, the endpoints of integration, I can't just list them as 0 and 1. And the reason I can't just list them as 0 and 1 is because this represents an area under the curve. And if the area that I find from this integral does not match the area I find from this integral, then this equal sign doesn't make any sense. If I say two things are equal in mathematics, they need to be the same. And if I have an area of one region that's not equal to the area of another region, I can't say they're equal. So, I'll show you that in a second, but for right now, what I want you to be able to do is properly adjust your endpoints of integration. And it's really simple to do because you've already done the legwork in making this transformation right here. It transforms everything on the inside of your function as well as every other point that could have existed on the x-axis. It'll transform everything for you consistently. It is a function of of u. So for instance, I could say the function u of x is equal to x squared plus 1, if you really want to see it as a function. So any x value that you put in, so for instance, if this is integrated dx, then these endpoints are x values. So I can just plug in each of those x values. So if I put in 0, for instance, 0 squared plus 1, which is 1. So what that means is the lower bound on my new integral is 1. You don't have to put u equals 1. I'm only emphasizing that I've got a new variable, that's all. It really is now just from 1. 
if I plug the upper endpoint, which is x equals 1, into my function u, it's 1 squared plus 1. 1 and 1 give me 2, so this goes up to u equals 2. Now, I will integrate. Yeah, I think I'll come down this way so I have plenty of space. Okay. So, 1 half. If I integrate u squared with respect to u, it would be u to the third power divided by 3. And then I evaluate that between 1 and 2, which would give me 1 sixth. Now, here's the cool part. A lot of instructors that will allow you to not change your endpoints, and then all you have to do is change them back to change everything back to the variable x in the end, and then plug in and get your answer. It's not necessary here. These variables, 1 and 2, match the variable of integration. You just plug those in for u. So I have then 2 cubed minus 1 cubed, which would be 1 sixth of 8 minus 1, which would be 7, or 7 sixths. It's a very clean way of getting the answer. The alternative is this. And I'm going to do it in red because I very much feel that it's wrong. So the integral from 0 to 1 of x times x squared plus 1 squared dx. Substitution would be the same. Bring the 1 half over. So here I am at this point where I substitute 1 half, and it pains me to write 0 to 1 because it's incorrect. And it would still be u squared du. So then 1 half u cubed over 3 from 0 to 1, which then becomes 1 sixth of uh, u cubed from 0 to 1. OK, but we have to switch back to the variable x. So then I'll have 1 sixth of x squared plus 1 cubed from 0 to 1. And that will give me 1 sixth of 1 squared plus 1 cubed minus 0 squared plus 1 cubed which would be 1 sixth. 1 squared plus 1 is 2, so that's 2 cubed. 0 squared plus 1 is 1, and that's 1 cubed. I end up with 7 sixths again. Same answer, but I can't stress this enough. Number one, these two values are not equal. Secondly, these two values are, are not equal. So you make two mistakes that just happen to be very uh, much going to cancel each other out. So that's almost forgivable. But here's the thing that really gets me. Look at, look at this right here. Don't these operations look familiar to you? They should. We did them right here and right here. We did them ahead of time. You're going to have to do them anyway. Why not just go ahead and do it early, be done with it? It makes the problem so much cleaner and correct. So let me show you graphically how this all is going to pan out and really convince you that this is a mistake, that you shouldn't leave the endpoints of integration in terms of x through the problem. In front of you right now is the graph of uh, first in blue x times x squared plus 1 quantity squared. And then in green you have 0.5. Uh, it, I had to graph it as x squared, but think of it as 1 half u squared. 
So you have your function prior to substitution and your function after substitution. I don't think that there's a better argument for this doesn't work because if you look at the total area under the curve of your substituted function from 0 to 1, that is clearly not equal to the area under the original curve. It just doesn't work. Okay? And you can see the computed area over here. The integral, the integral of the original function is 1.1667. The integral of the substituted function is 0.1667. So they're off by quite a bit. However, if I update the endpoints to the new endpoints, so I'm going to take the green curve and switch it to where it's between the endpoints 1 and 2. Now it should, you might not be able to see it visually and say, okay, clearly this green area now is the same size as this blue area. But it should at least be now close and it's closer than it was you have to admit that but if you look at the computation off to the right the integral from 0 to 1 of the original function is 1.1667 the integral under the curve of the second the substituted function is also 1.1667 from 1 to 2 so they are the same size that's what we need in mathematics, equality. When we say two things are equal, they have to be equal. Lastly, I just have some additional examples with substitution just because it is a technique that generally takes students some time to be able to get proficient at it, but it is an extremely important skill, especially if you're going on into higher levels of calculus. It's expected that you can do this right, right from the out start in Calc 2. So here's an example. I have the integral of 2x squared times the square root of x cubed plus 1 dx. There's two different polynomial pieces. So I need to pick the one with the higher degree. And if that degree is uh, higher by 1, it's perfect. Because when I take the derivative of it, it will match the degree of the other portion in the function. Now I have 2x squared inside my function instead of 3x squared. Simple enough to handle. I can divide this by 3, pull the 2 out. So this would be 2 thirds. And the x squared dx is going to get replaced with the 1 third du, because this 3 will cancel out here. So that's fine. That's taken care of. The part underneath the square root gets replaced with u, so that would be u to the one-half power, du. Now I just need to integrate using the power rule. Two-thirds u to the three-halves power over three-halves plus c, which would be two-thirds times two-thirds now, I'm not doing a definite integral. I'm doing an indefinite integral, so I don't have endpoints on my integration. I do need to change back to the original variable here. So I have to go back to x cubed plus 1 at this point. It's only for definite integrals where if you change the variable of integration, you have to change the endpoints of integration as well. So it looks like I have 4 ninths x cubed plus 1 to the 3 halves power plus c. Here's another example. 6x cubed over 4x cubed minus 9 altogether raised to the third power. Uh, here I have a part that is the 4x cubed minus 9, which is 1 degree higher than the 6x squared. So I think that's what I'm going to use for my substitution. Because if I take du then, that would give me 12x squared 
dx. And in order to simplify this, I have a 6x squared dx resting in my function. I don't have to divide this entire 12 over. I can handle this constant any way that I want. So for instance, if I divide 2 over, then I have 1 half du would equal 6x squared dx. And that would take care of what's on the inside. So y you can do substitutions in lots of different manners. So this would give me 1 half, and then the 6x squared dx are taken care of by du. So I just have a 1 in the numerator. 4x cubed minus 9 replaced with u to the third power. So 1 half, if I change this into u to the negative third, that would give me something that I can use a power rule for. So 1 half, u to the negative third, what I would do is add 1 to that exponent, making it u to the negative second, divide by the new one, plus c. So it looks like I would have negative 1 fourth, taking care of the constants, times 1 over u squared plus c. And then finally, bringing the variable, variable u back into x, I can make this negative 1 over 4 times the quantity 4x cubed minus 9 quantity squared plus c. Here's another example, trying to pick things that look more and more intimidating as we go along because you're able to handle the intimidating looking ones now will make your homework that much easier. So the integral of 20x sine of 5x squared minus 3. So how easy this goes is dependent upon what you choose for u. If I let my substituting function u be 5x squared minus 3, just the argument of that trig function, exactly what the rule stated earlier today said, then the derivative of u would be 10x dx. Now, I'm going to do something different with these multiplied constants because I have a 20x sitting inside my function, but only 10x here. I can divide the 10 over, bring the 20 out, that's fine. Or I could consider saying 2 times du would be 20x dx. And that's fine as well. I just need things to match up in the end. So this then, I could put a 2 on the outside. 20x dx is going to get replaced with du. And then sine of 5x squared minus 3 is going to become sine of u. So 2 times the integral sine u du. So integral of sine, let's think about this. So the derivative of cosine is negative, which means the integral of cosine is positive. So it's the integral of sine that's actually negative. So I need to make sure I change this into negative cosine u plus c. So negative 2 cosine of 5x squared minus 3 plus c. And one last one here. Again, continuing with making them look as intimidating as possible. The integral of 8 times the quantity e to the 4x minus 4 raised to the 1 -fifth power times e to the 4x dx. Okay. It's all about what you choose for u. Because if you pick the right thing for u to start off, it's going to make your problem very simple after you make that substitution. That's the whole point of the substitution. So usually what we said for exponentials is that you would pick whatever's in the exponent of your exponential. 
which would lend me to thinking that u should be 4x. But here's the thing. I don't think that's going to work here because if you'll notice, I do have a part that is um, the close to the derivative of 4x, that 8 is close. It, I could adjust to that. But I would still have two functions that are exponential and then also this thing to the 1 -fifth power. But if you recall, the derivative of an exponential function is another exponential function. Since there's two different exponential functions here, this is a special case where what I think I need to do is let u be e to the 4x minus 4. Because that's going to simplify the part that's underneath that fifth root. And on the outside, I also have this e to the 4x. It would be, so the derivative of u would be 4e to the 4x. But that's OK. I can handle that and take care of the 8 with that 4 that exists right now. But I have this other portion that still involves e to the 4x. So this is going to work. I will multiply both sides by 2, giving me 8 e to the 4x dx. So this will become, uh, go ahead and pull the 2 out, so 2 times the integral. and e to the 4x minus 4 becomes u, so u to the 1 -fifth power. 8 e to the 4x dx is all getting replaced with 2 du. I already have my 2 outside of the integral, so then I just have a du on the inside. It's taken that really not so approachable looking function and very quickly changed it into something that is reasonable. This is just integrated using the power rule at this point. So 2 times, so u to the 1 fifth, we're going to add 1 to that exponent, so u to the 6 fifth power over 6 fifths plus c. And this would be 2 times 6 fifths, which would be, I'll just write it, 2 times, uh, sorry, 2 times. 5 6 because it will invert, of course. A u is the function e to the 4x minus 4, then that's going to go to the 6 fifths power. 2 goes into 6 3 times, so my final answer, fully simplified, is 5 thirds e to the 4x minus 4 to the 6 fifths plus c. Now, that's probably one of the more difficult examples I could give you. If you didn't follow it, you weren't sure exactly how it worked out, don't stress. Go to your homework, practice. They'll start off with easier examples, and you'll build from those easy examples and get your confidence up. And once you get your confidence up with the easier examples, you move on to, to more complex versions. and. Uh, I think in the end, you should be able to handle problems like this. But start slow, begin with the easier ones, and build upward.